Hi guys. Happy Resurrection Sunday. My name is Bruce, and although I'm the same size as the children, I'm not one of them. Not nearly as cute. I am the founding pastor and one of the teaching pastors, and today I have the privilege of sharing the Resurrection Sunday or Easter message with you. <laughs> Yay! So if you would, tap, turn, scroll, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As you're turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I've had this conversation with several people in the last few weeks preparing for this message, and I, I just want to encourage you guys that our staff and volunteers labor intensely to make these services wonderful, and I just want you to appreciate with me all the effort that goes in. And Lizette, if I could just stop you before you go out real quick, it's Lizette's birthday today, so this is all an elaborate <laughs> birthday surprise for you. Yeah, and whether the services are perfect or ideal, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus rose again. And uh, this is the most glorious day in history, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's the most important day on the Christian calendar. It's the most important day on humanity's calendar. Because Jesus rose again, we know that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice, and that's why Good Friday is good. Amen? Amen. Now, you have come here for a variety of reasons, but one thing that I can say for certain among all of us, that each of us desires a new beginning in some area of our life. Each of us would like a do-over, so to speak, would like a fresh start, would like a new beginning in some aspect of our lives. We want to know that we can receive favor anew from the most important person, we want to know that what is wrong can be made right. And the answer isn't to escape from what is wrong. The answer is to embrace what is right, to embrace right affections, to embrace our right identity, to embrace our right purpose in life. And through Jesus' death and resurrection, you're not only going to discover why you should embrace a right affection, a right identity, a right purpose, but you'll discover how. And that's why we are here this morning. And so if you haven't got there already, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading at verse 15, and we'll stop at verse 17 for now. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. Let's pray. Father, you've gathered us here to meet with you, to worship you, to honor you, to learn from you, to be transformed by you, to receive your favor anew. We thank you for the truth of the resurrection. May it change everything about us to make us more like Jesus. We ask this now in his precious name. Amen. So I want to encourage you as you're taking notes, the stuff we're talking about today is Christ's new beginning. Christ's new beginning. And I get to teach with my hands in my pocket because I've been here 29 years. So I get to do that. Just act all casual and stuff like I've done this once before. And the object that I believe God intends for us is that we would live for Christ. That we would live for Christ. The first big idea that we need to see is we need new affections, new affections, that we're living for Jesus. So at verse 15, we discover that we need to live for Jesus rather than self. We need to live for Jesus rather than self. So Paul begins at verse 15, he says, Jesus died for all. 
So it, it is this declaration that is perhaps the most familiar declaration in all the Bible, that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This idea that Jesus died for all is, is the universal sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But it's also personal that he died for you as an individual as well as for the world. And this sacrifice only becomes effective once you have received Christ that you choose to yield your life and to follow him as Lord and Savior. So Paul says, because Jesus died for all, that we should stop living for ourselves, live for him because he died and rose again at verse 15. So I want you to see this with me. The progression of the idea is because of Jesus' death on the cross and the resurrection, there's a moral implication that we should stop living for self and live for God. And so the question should be reasoned. Like, that's a big old ask, isn't it? You're asking me to stop living for myself and to live for Jesus. Why? Like, how can I know this is sure? Is there evidence, and dare I say evidence, beyond a reasonable doubt that we should know that Jesus actually rose from the dead? And because you asked, I'm going to tell you what the evidence is. I'm just going to assume that's a, a reasonable question. And so I want to show you the evidence beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, I've been to Israel on several occasions, and we plan on going there this fall. We're praying for peace in Jerusalem, peace in the Middle East. We hope to be able to go. And, and usually our tours end with a visit at the garden tomb. And there you see the place where Jesus was in turn, where his body was laid. And it's moving to go into that place and to realize that the tomb is empty, to imagine what that was like for the apostles as they saw that empty tomb on that very first Resurrection Sunday, as the women who came to honor Jesus encountered the empty tomb. And I've gone there now literally with hundreds of people, and it's visceral, the response, to see people moved to tears to see people moved to want to kiss the stone, to see people just go with this sense of contemplation and perhaps they become very somber or very elated, a whole host of emotions. But what I want you to appreciate is that in your entire lifetime, there has never been an Easter service canceled because they found the missing body, right? It's not like, well, they're not doing service this weekend because they found the body. And so this is an important understanding because if you were to rustle up the proverbial usual suspects, you have the Romans, you have the Jewish leaders, and you have the disciples. So Roman guards are post at the, the tomb so that the body can't be removed. And so if a Roman guard lets a prisoner escape, you suffer the same fate as the prisoner. So when you're guarding a dead man, that's an incentive to make sure you get the job done. So we can safely say that the Roman guards didn't take the body. And then the idea that the Jewish leaders took the body, if they took the body, they would have presented the body. Could you imagine here the Christians are claiming that Jesus rose from the dead and the Jewish leaders, gotcha, here's the body. But that doesn't happen. And you think maybe the disciples, and, and consider this, seven of these guys are fishermen. It appears only one of them had a sword. But assuming somehow that they overpowered these trained Roman soldiers that were guarding the tomb, and they took the body, well, each of them faced a martyr's death. And so it's only reasonable to assume if they knew it was a lie that at least one of them would have cracked and said, we made the whole thing up, here's where the body's hidden. But each of them was willing to be martyred because they knew it was true. So you've got the missing body. Then you have the martyr's death. A, a third bit of evidence is the transformed lives. So these disciples, as Jesus is being crucified, they all run in fear. But after his resurrection, they are boldly telling everybody about Jesus' death, his resurrection, this good news that the Messiah had come, that the kingdom was now available to us. They're transformed lives. And then 
the eyewitnesses. So the gospel records 10 occurrences where Jesus was revealed after his resurrection to followers and others. And Paul says on one occasion, there was over 500 people. And Paul says most of them are still alive. He's saying, look, you can talk to these people, eyewitnesses. Look, I was a trial attorney for 25 years. So I know, what, first of all, what evidence looks like. I know what evidence beyond a reasonable doubt looks like. I also know what it's like to have unimpeachable witnesses. The apostles, those who were there, were unimpeachable witnesses. The evidence for the resurrection is overwhelming. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. Simon Greenleaf, who is the dean of Harvard Law School, I mean, you've got to be smartical to get into that law school. I didn't. Um, all right, Simon Greenleaf says, according to the laws of evidence as used in courts of law in the United States, the evidence in support of the resurrection is greater than any event of antiquity. So this is why Paul says there's a moral implication because Christ has died for us and rose again. Therefore, we should stop living for ourselves and live for him. Now, I would suggest that each of us Pretty much, when you encounter other people, it doesn't take long for you to figure out what their jam is, what they're all about, what the master passion of their life is. Now, God's not saying that you can't love other things, other people. What he's saying is that he wants to be the master passion of your life, that Jesus is to be the master passion. And let me also caution you on this thought. It's easy to think in our culture, well, instead of being selfish, I'll just live for others. That seems like a good person sort of thing to do. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't say we should live for others instead of living for self. See this. He says you've got to live for Christ because until you live for Christ, your affections and your values and your worldview are misordered. And it's not until you get them in proper order that you could properly love Others. So he starts off, live for Christ, not for self. Second thought that Paul's communicating here about new affections is to live like spiritual people. So at verse 16, he said, look, we've known Jesus in the flesh. In other words, we'd walked with him. We saw he's a real human being, but he's also God. But we don't know him that way any longer. He's talking about having a spiritual birth, being born of the Holy Spirit. And so now... We view the world differently. Our eyes have been opened to the reality of the spiritual world. Our eyes have been opened to the reality of God. Our eyes have been opened to the reality that there's more to this life than the material world. And so he says we live like spiritual people. Now, one thing I want to say about this idea of spiritual people is there's two kinds of spiritual people in the sense that there's spiritual people have the wrong brand of spirituality because it's contrary to the Bible. And then there's spiritual people who have the, dare I say, right brand because it's consistent with the Holy Spirit, consistent with the Word of God. So let me give you an example. We do a Halloween alternative here, uh, like a carnival. And so one of the booths was called, and I got to enunciate this clearly, okay? Psalm reader. Psalm reader. Not palm reader. Psalm reader. But we put a sign above it with this like crystal ball painting so it looked like palm reader. And this charming, lovely young woman behind the sign would share a psalm, whatever psalm God put in her heart. She'd write it out on a beautiful card with lovely calligraphy. It was my wife, Karen, by the way, in case you're wondering who it was. And so this one woman came up, and Karen's like opening the Bible to read a psalm, and this woman's like, I thought you were going to read my palm. And she's like, no, it, it says psalm reader. She's like, oh, that's a ripoff. It's like, <laughs> Hello. And, and so here's the thing. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you want to recognize that psychics, astrology, reincarnation, crystals, the idea of inanimate objects having energy, all of that is contrary to a biblical worldview. Therefore, I'm going to call that the wrong kind of spirituality. Now, on the right kind of story, now, you people on this side of the room, you think I'm saying you're the right kind, and you people over here are the wrong kind. Sorry, I didn't mean it. Okay, now back to you, the right kind of spirituality. 
So here we have the Holy Spirit transforming us to be more like Jesus. Now, I recognize that if I said to you, do you want to be more holy today? For some of us, that just sounds like really daunting. It's like, hey, I just came here because my family member, my friend invited me here in the holy, whoa. But if I said to you, do you want to be more beautiful? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Look at me. Yes, I need that, please. Right? Now, beauty... As we're talking about here is being like Jesus, right? I am not going to be six foot four and have a square jaw and cheekbones and look amazing. And I'm okay with that. Some of you are smiling like, that's right, that's never going to happen to you. But beauty is being like Jesus. By the way, the archaeological evidence shows us that the common person in the first century, based on Roman soldiers' armor, stands five foot four. And we are told of Jesus that there was nothing about his physical appearance that was outstanding. In other words, when you looked into his eyes, they were so green and he had a halo above his head and he was glowing. He just looked kind of like an ordinary five foot four Jewish person. Just saying. So that's one aspect of living like spiritual people. Here's another aspect. The sense that spiritual people understand that there's more in this universe than just the material world. We live in a secular humanistic society that tends to view the entire world as being simply the material or physical world. Spiritual people understand that there is a spiritual presence, that there is a spiritual dimension to our universe because you've received the Holy Spirit. And so here's the caution. I think it is possible for followers of Jesus to get lulled into a sense of a material world around us where you could go hours Days, weeks, months without an awareness of your dependence upon God and your devotion to God. In essence, functional atheism. And so we're to live like spiritual people with new affections, living for Jesus rather than living for self. That's a fresh new beginning. Second, we have a new identity. Look with me at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ, you are a new creation. To be in Christ means that at some point you chose to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You are now in Christ, and he is in in you, and therefore you are a new creation. Now, how could I describe this? Uh, I imagine many of us in this room are familiar with the very hungry caterpillar. (laughs) Love this children's book that's been translated into countless languages and read by countless people around the globe. It is the story of a very hungry caterpillar, which will be many of you within hours as you partake of an Easter meal. And that caterpillar then is transformed into a beautiful butterfly. You knew the right answer. Don't be shy, right? And and so I could say this idea of a new creation, we could see that in the metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly. But more importantly, in the last 28 years now, entering my 29th year, I have seen thousands of thousands, of thousands of lives transformed in Christ, a new creation. Second, you have a new identity. In Christ, your former identity has passed away. In Christ, you have a new beginning. All things have passed away. That your former nature, your former identity, no longer controls who you are and who you will become. Now, I have several identities. <laughs> You're thinking, oh, the pastor's got a fake ID. Like, I got a pocket full of fake identity. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I have an identity as a husband, 
I have an identity as a dad. I have an identity as a pastor. I have an identity as a cyclist. I have an identity as a Dodgers fan. I have an identity as a pizza snob. And I'm not even ashamed of that. I'm good with that. Now, here's the thing. Uh, each of us has a sense of our primary identity. What you identify as your primary identity. And similarly, there are secondary identities. What I'm encouraging you to realize is your primary identity is now child of God, follower of Jesus, if you are in Christ. That should be your primary identity. So that when you think about what's my primary identity, the first thought that comes to mind is I am a follower of Jesus. Secondary identities, they're okay, but they have to be in order, first identity. So would you identify yourself as a follower of Jesus? Would others who know you, would they say of you that, oh, there, he's a follower of Jesus, she's a follower of Jesus. I don't care what we call it. When, when I first came to Christ after growing up in an observant Jewish home, people said, are you a completed Jew, a messianic Jew? Or are you a Jew born again? Are you a born again Jew? All I thought was like, I'm not even sure what I am. I'm just a follower of Jesus. I, I settled on a Jew born anew, because that just sounded good. Right? So I don't care what terminology you're putting on it, but is that your identity as child of God? So we need to understand this. Third, in Christ, all things are new. Behold, all things have become new. At the end of verse 17, it refers to the idea that not only in your position are you now reconciled to God, but in practice you become more and more like Jesus. So you're receiving this new identity anew. You're receiving God's favor anew. So here's what I'd ask you to think about with me. What is one area of your life Think about this. What's one area of your life that you would like a fresh start, that you would like a new beginning? One area of your life where you would like to just simply turn the page and have a do-over, a fresh start, a new beginning. Think, think about this for a moment. Don't leave here with, and miss this. What's that one area of your life that comes to mind right now as God's Spirit brings it to your understanding. For me, it didn't take long. God wants to bestow his favor upon you anew today in Christ, a new identity. So we have new affections, a new identity, and now a new purpose, a new life in Christ. So I'm going to look, beginning at verse 18, ask you to follow along. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So between verses 18 to 21, we're going to see the word reconciliation or reconciled five times. And that term means to restore favor anew. All of us need to be reconciled to God because our sin separates us from God. And it's not until we confess our sin and we repent and receive Christ that we then have this new reconciliation, favor anew from God. But I want to encourage you that, that we have this new message. We are inviting people to be reconciled to God. The reason why your family member was so concerned about you coming here today, the reason why your friend was so concerned and they kept saying to you, you got to come, you got to come, is they want to see you reconciled to God. They want to see you receive this forgiveness anew from God. And so the very first time you receive Christ, you receive this reconciliation anew. But I want to encourage you, this reconciliation is still available to us who have received Christ. Perhaps in the last year, you've drifted from God. Perhaps in the last year, 
You've lost some of the passion, some of the zeal that you had for God. Perhaps your life has been apathetic towards the things of God. Perhaps you've been doing things that you know aren't pleasing to God. And you sense tension, you sense conflict in your relationship with God and others. And you just want to know that you can be restored anew, that you can be reconciled anew. And God wants to welcome you back under his roof. God wants to welcome you back into proximity with him. God wants to welcome you back into his family and closeness to your father. So we have this new message. We have this new ministry as ambassadors for Jesus. So at the end of verse 19, God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though we're God, God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. You have a new purpose in life. You are a brand ambassador for Jesus. You are an influencer for Jesus. And you think about being a brand ambassador for maybe there's a product that you love. Maybe there's a service that you love. And so you just want to tell everybody on your social media account how awesome this thing is. And, and you're not trying to do it for profit or gain. It's not like you're in, in some marketing scheme. You're just so excited about this. You tell everybody you got to have this. It's like we call this, my people call this a maven. A maven is so excited about something, they convince you to change your plans, to change your life, because you want to experience what the maven is telling you about. Like, I'm a maven, and I will convince people who are visiting another city, they got to go there for pizza, or they got to go there for a sandwich, or they got to go experience this sight, this attraction, because I'm so excited about it. Now, I'm not getting any royalties. I'm not getting any kickbacks. I'm not getting a percentage on this. I just want them to experience what is so epic and awesome. I'm an ambassador, an influencer, and so are you. I want to commission you today. Not only are you an ambassador, not only are you an influencer, but today you can be a maven. Oi. Did you hear about the dyslectic rabbi? He said, yo. <laughs> it always takes a while for the Gentiles to figure this stuff out. The Jews, they get the stuff early, but I'm not going to point you out. <laughs> we'll do that at Passover. Um, unless you know the product, unless you know the service, you're not excited. So you're going to have to learn of Jesus, learn from Jesus. And when you learn of Jesus and learn from Jesus, you want to tell everybody about him because he's the one who's truly beautiful. And so, we have this new purpose in life. And that sounds pretty daunting to try to do this. What's the means to do this? And it's Jesus' perfect sacrifice that allows his followers to be right with God anew. Verse 21, where he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So, Here's what's going on. Jesus took your sin and my sin. Okay? You're with me on this? That he became sin for us. And then, in exchange, he gives us his righteousness. And I just want you to understand, that's a pretty good trade. Uh, if you're thinking about, like, you're going to trade lunch at school, and it's like, I got an apple, and you got a tangerine, and so we're going to trade, or you got a banana, and I got a cutie, and we're going to trade. That's okay, but understand, Jesus took your sin, and in exchange gave you his righteousness, so that when God looks at you, all he sees is the perfection of his son. The means is what Jesus did. Now, your part, things like spiritual disciplines, like reading the Bible, praying, regularly being involved in a healthy church where you learn the word of God, cultivating community, friendships with other followers of Jesus, 
sharing your faith, serving, communing with God, contemplating God. All of those things help you to experience these new affections, new priorities, and then this new purpose in life, a new identity. But that's not what makes you right with God. You are right with God as soon as you receive Jesus. His sacrifice is the means of us being right. You're right simply through faith in Christ. It is a gift of God. And so once you receive that gift, as you explore this gift, you discover how it transforms your life, gives you new values, a new sense of affections, a new perspective, an eternal perspective. It gives you a new sense of your identity. It gives you a new sense in your purpose in life. It gives the opportunity for every single one of us in this room today, every single one of us who is listening or watching this, to receive a new God's restoration God's reconciliation. And I'm going to give every single person here an opportunity right now. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. First of all, close your eyes. Please, just close your eyes. Nobody's going to harass you. Second, open your heart. Third, listen. Listen intently. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior... He's standing at the door of your heart, and he's knocking. If you want to let him in, just let him know right now. There's no special prayer that you have to say. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to walk forward. Just let him know, and he's promised to forgive you of the sin that separates you. He's promised to give you spiritual life. You can experience life with him this day into eternity. And if you're doing that right now and you feel something special, that's wonderful. If you don't feel anything different, it doesn't change the reality of what's just happened. For those of us who have already received Jesus, and today we're just aware that we need a fresh, new beginning. If that's you right now, God is hearing your prayer, and he wants to assure you that he wants to welcome you closer to him than you've been. He wants to give you that new beginning. He wants to give you this freshness in your life with him. Let this be the glorious day as we celebrate his resurrection, the perfect day for a new beginning for each and every one of us. And we ask this now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to encourage you, if today was the day that you first received Christ, we want to provide some very special gifts for you. For those of you who are visiting, we've got welcome gifts for you as well. And for all of us, we've just experienced a new beginning, so let's celebrate it and praise to our God.